Chris Monkeypox outbreak and provide an update about where we are on the on the outbreak. Uh, how communities have addressed the threat and discuss how we can help to support um, communication around the virus. Um, you know, um, just want to give you one um, corporate announcement. Um, tomorrow, APHA is um, with the National Academy of Medicine is sponsoring another one of our webinars. Uh, um, we're going to be doing a monkeypox uh, webinar on the state of the science um, from 5 to 630. I just hope that all of you can uh, um, you can fit that into your schedule uh, to participate in that. I think that'll be a really, really good um, 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 webinar which I think will complement today's um, presentation quite well. So if we go to the next slide, um, which shows basically our agenda. Um, so our agenda today is um, gonna have some really exciting speakers, which I'll be introducing in a moment. Um, we're gonna have each of those speakers speak uh, for a, a period of time. And then um, at the end, we'll be able to um, um, have some Q and A and have a, a kind of a group discussion um, I'm going to be asking um, Angie McGowan to, to moderate that, uh, that group discussion for us today. Um, and then if you go to the next slide. So here are our three speakers, um, um, Dr. Um, Inger um, 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 Demon um, is a leading pox virus expert and the Senior Advisor for Science for the CDC 2022 Multinational Monkeypox Response. She's also the Director of the CDC Division of High Consequence Pathogens and Pathology at the National Center for Emerging Zoonic and Infectious Diseases. Um, our other speaker is Dr. Wafa um, El Sader, is who's the Executive uh, Vice President for Columbia Global and University Professor of Epidemiology and Medicine at Columbia University. And nearly two decades ago, he established the um, ICAP at uh, Columbia University, which is a global health center at uh, the Columbia Melbourne School of Public Health, um, now working in more than 30 countries around the world and in the United States. They focus on addressing major health threats and strengthening on health systems. And most recently, she serves as the head of the New York City Pandemic Response Institute at Columbia with key partnerships with the CUNY uh, School of Public Health. And Dr. Scott Ratson. Scott is a founder and editor in chief of the Journal of Health Communication, um, which international perspectives and distinguished lecturer at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. Uh, at CUNY, Dr. Ratson is a co lead of communication efforts with the Pandemic Response Institute. Um, he co founded Convince, which is a coalition for vaccine information communication and engagement, and he leads efforts with Convince USA and the Vaccine Equity Cooperative in which CUNY School of Public Health, as well as private sector activities with businesses, with business partners. Um, so let me turn over first to um, Dr. Damon to start off um, our discussions. Thanks all. Um, it's a pleasure um, to come to try to talk to you today. I've been asked in six to eight minutes to cover quite a waterfront of uh, what do Alliance members need to know about monkeypox in this outbreak. Um, some considerations writ large about monkeypox, what CDC is doing, what we can learn from COVID that can be applied to monkeypox and what can Alliance members do. So I'm not sure I'm going to get through all of that, but I hope there will be time for discussion to further um, to talk through some of those issues. So monkeypox has been considered a rare disease um, caused by infection with monkeypox virus. So full disclosure, um, I came to CDC um, 23 years ago with the intent to work on monkeypox virus and got retooled to work on the smallpox research agenda uh, really starting in 2000. Um, and then um, as we made progress in terms of diagnostics, um, vaccines and therapeutics. And we saw the monkeypox outbreak in the United States in 2003, began to do more global work with monkeypox what again, once again. So um, the virus, as we understood it, um, before this year, we would have told you that there are two well-known 
clades of virus, uh, one that was studied best in the 1980s in, um, in Ben Zaire, now known as DRC, and really modeled on what did we know about smallpox disease. So considered it to be a virus which was uh, spread by respiratory droplets, also could be spread by contact and with fomites, um, and characterized the disease in the context of smallpox in terms of comparing the case fatality rate so the case fatality rate uh, being less than what was seen uh, with monkeypox, far less than what was seen with smallpox, which was on average a 30% case fatality rate. With monkeypox, case fatality rate was just under 10%, and that was all in non-vaccinated individuals and also in children under the age of five in those studies. What distinguished monkeypox clinically from smallpox, which was a generalized rash illness with rash greatest on the extremities, the palms and soles, was the fact that you saw lymphadenopathy with monkeypox virus. So, um, at the same time, in um, as cases were being studied in Zaire, they had also been identified in many countries in Western Africa. And preliminary genetic characterization began to see that there were distinguishing characteristics in terms of the genomes between the viruses which had been obtained in West African countries versus those from Zaire and then later Cameroon as well and the Central African Republic. Fast forward to 2003, the United States, um, a, a consignment of West African rodents designed for the exotic pet trade in the United States was introduced. Uh, there was co-housing with North American prairie dogs. We saw disease transmission to prairie dogs, and those prairie dogs were then uh, disseminated through a various uh, set of activities um, in the Midwestern United States where uh, they were brought to people's homes as pets. The animals were infected, the animals became um, infectious um, with rash illness, uh, cough in many cases, um, and transmission was noted to humans, usually through direct contact with the animal. So a break in the skin, exposure to uh, excretion from uh, the prairie dog, a bite through the skin, um, and then in some cases seeing generalized rash as well. Uh, studies in the U.S. associated with that looked at the protection of prior vaccination. So in most cases, vaccine had been given um, at least 35 or 25 to 35 years prior. And although there's a little bit of variance, um, the majority of the studies didn't see an appreciable benefit of prior vaccination and prevention of severe disease. Um, although writ large, the disease in the US was far less severe than what had been seen in the Zaire case series. So there was no deaths. Of the 37 confirmed cases in the United States, there was a nice comparison um, controlling for both age and vaccine status. And pretty convincingly, I think, um, in a article published in 2005, demonstrated that biologically there was a difference between both genetically the virus we saw in the United States, which the origin was from Ghana, um, and uh, viruses and the clinical presentation that had been seen in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and specifically looked at a number of open reading frames. And that's really what us, let, led us to say that there were two clades of virus. Now we'll fast forward to 2017 um, in Nigeria, and we began to see, whereas we had not had heard reports of cases of monkeypox since 1978, there are now hundreds of cases being reported from multiple states across the country, and it really wasn't clear. Uh, there's some really nice information now coming out from the clinical community in Nigeria talking more about uh, what they're seeing, and there's a couple of really good publications as well out there uh, describing the clinical presentation. The virus there was uh, genotypically uh, linked quite nicely into um, the, what we would call, what we formerly called the West African clade of virus, we're now calling it clade two. And now fast forward to 2022, when we start to see, in addition to sort of the handful or two handfuls of cases in travelers coming from Nigeria being reported in the United States, in the UK, in Singapore, uh, we now began to hear additional cases uh, being reported from the UK about individuals uh, with disease who had not traveled, and then specifically a cluster of cases that 
were identified in a sexual health clinic um, and linking to uh, the risk factor for uh, male to male sexual activity. So um, what we're beginning to see is a story where we're seeing differences in the potential routes of exposure from what had been classically thought to be uh, respiratory droplet exposure um, in DRC, uh, what seems to be more contact and potentially some respiratory droplet exposure um, in the US in 2003. Um, uncertain at this point still in Nigeria, uh, 2017 to 2019, and in the current outbreak, really far more reports of poten potential permucosal and, and really high virus exposure leading to infection. So, um, that's sort of a, a fast forward through the virus, the virus evolution uh, disease presentation. And I think with these viruses, we know that the route of exposure really um, affects how disease is manifest in individuals. And I think that is that is clearly part of what we're seeing um, in this current situation where we're seeing lots of very severe disease and uh, symptomatic disease affecting with proctitis um, and other mucosal surfaces associated with the glands of the penis. So, um, but it's important to step back and this is a disease that is spread through close contact. And so monkeypox can be acquired by all people. And so uh, the information that CDC is trying to provide really tries to help people understand what are potential risk factors and how to protect themselves. So status update, situational update, where are we? Internationally, as of the 16th of August, there's over 37,000 confirmed cases in 93 countries. Domestically, we now have over 12,000, so 12,689 cases across 51 jurisdictions, including 49 states, so Washington, DC, and the Puerto Rico. Um, we are seeing, so if we look at case fatalities as disease severity among those uh, 37,000 cases being reported, CDC is aware of five deaths in Spain, Brazil, Ecuador, and India. The reports we have are these are all individuals with some degree of immunocompromising conditions. Um, the majority of individuals affected are disproportionately men who have sex with men um, and are uh, male uh, signed sex at birth. Um, and as of the 12th, among those with race and, race and ethnicity data available to CDC, 36% of cases are among non-Hispanic white people, 33% among Hispanic or Latino people, 26 among non-Hispanic black or African-American people, and 4% among Asian. So a timeline, so uh, May 17th, the first US case was reported to CDC. The same day, the CDC um, structured an emergency response. On the 20th, we issued a health alert uh, network notice released to alert clinicians. Uh, three more since then um, to provide updates in terms of clinical manifestations um, and test availability, which has ramped up considerably. Um, a number of morbidity and mortality weekly reports have been published providing information about this particular outbreak um, and uh, rolled out an enhanced national vaccination strategy um, in addition to the prior approaches which had been classically informed by smallpox eradication efforts where you identify cases, you identify their contacts, you identify who is a high risk contact and you rapidly offer them post-exposure vaccination um, in addition to offering vaccination to those who are at high risk uh, because of potential occupational exposure which has been written about by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. We do have a licensed vaccine now, which is less reactogenic than the ones formerly used during smallpox eradication. And those are two dose, uh, 28 days apart vaccines. And we're rolling out, I think, as everybody has seen, a strategy to be able to get more vaccine out of one vaccine vial by using an alternative um, administration strategy using intradermal um, in terms in turn, instead of subcutaneous strategies. Also developed, so, and, and that vaccine was largely developed through efforts of the smallpox um, research agenda that the US government has supported now since um, 1999, 2000. 
Also um, being used in this response is an antiviral, uh, which was developed and licensed for smallpox, um, whereas the vaccine Genios is licensed for both smallpox and monkeypox. Um, the, vac the antiviral is known as T-pox or T-coviramat, where if you look at the older literature, it's also known as Arrestivir. Um, more recently in August, uh, there's a number of, of updates in terms of White House um, um, uh, administration for the response. So Robert Fenton um, and Dimitri Deskalakis from the CDC, Robert Fenton from FEMA, um, coordinating the administration's monkeypox response. A national a public health emergency was declared by HHS on the 4th of August um, and then announced the emergency use authorization, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, for the alternative dosing regimen for the Genios vaccine, which is the less reactogenic two-dose vaccine, uh, which will allow uh, a greater amount of vaccine to be used and administered. Um, there's also been a number of guidances that CDC has updated uh, with regards to that vaccine, and CDC is also in the process of updating the processes to use, acquire, and administer uh, the antiviral that I mentioned, TPOX, which um, has been shown in a number of animal studies, not not with this type of infection and route of infection uh, to be effective in clearance of virus at rash onset in a number of different animal models. So what can we learn from COVID that can be applied to monkeypox virus? Public health emergency um, allows the secretary and HHS increased flexibility powers to aid the federal government's response to the outbreak and can be helpful to facilitate certain data sharing from state and local health departments to CDC if their local laws or regulations require a public health emergency for additional data sharing uh, to help inform uh, municipalities and regional decision making. Um, CDC has been strongly involved in community engagement, and Dr. Deskalakis, I think, has been uh, working quite actively within the, uh, the group that is disproportionately affected right now in the United States to try to get out harm reduction messages in terms of and also getting information out about uh, ways to protect in terms of vaccines, uh, ways to treat, and um, access to testing. So I'm going to leave what Alliance members can do to the end because I've taken way too much time. So I appreciate um, your listening. Thank you very, very much, Doc. Um, so um, I will turn it over to Dr. Uh, El Sadar. Actually, uh, Scott is going to start. Scott's first. going to go first? Okay. Yeah, he's going to go first, uh, George. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Go ahead, Scott. Scott, if you're speaking, you're still muted. How is that now? Good. I, I can hear you. Okay. After all this time, I still was speaking. <laughs> thanking you, Georges, and thanking Wafa for turning it over to me and Angie for all the great work of all of you in the Alliance. I've been participating in, and happy that I can go through about a dozen slides here and then turn it over to Wafa to speak more about the Pandemic Response Institute. And, you know, just quickly, uh, we've been involved with this for quite some time. And uh, just, you know, as we see the beginning of this, first it was COVID and, and now it's monkeypox. I've used this slide for years going back to, you know, mad cow crisis, HIV, uh, you name it. We have a, a, a big issue of how we communicate moving from fiction to reality. And I've been editing the Journal of Health Communication for 27 years, and we have a strong base on how we communicate about uncertainty. And um, in the, the NIH piece cited at the bottom, how we communicate on health risk communication also uh, relates to this and understanding the value judgments that people have about risk. And um, secondly, of course, we know that communication campaigns work. Uh, and they uh, work on knowledge, actions, behavior, and social norms. And the meta-analysis by Bob Hornick at Annenberg is cited here, which shows the modest but yet uh, effective amount of good communication campaigns. So we have the base. Uh, I've been engaged when I was on the CDC Board of Scientific Councils on Infectious Disease. It was during the Ebola crisis. I wrote this piece, and very clearly we knew, just as we had in the past, that we can modify behavior with high integrity 
and a single authoritative source to provide information with e intermediaries and the tools. And some of the work that Dr. Damon has mentioned is, is quite complex. So how do we make this simple to reinforce the message? And we knew that what we could do for Ebola. I later wrote a, a piece with um, Ken Mortsugu, former uh, acting surgeon general on this. And then when COVID hit, we were at the National Academies board meeting. I serve on the board of global health um, and Larry Gostin and others, we said, we need to write something. This was before it was even termed a pandemic. It was a, pen, a public health emergency of international concern. And we wanted to at least get the United States initially to engage more with a, a leading governmental medical spokesperson. And we called on whether the Surgeon General or a point person, and also to create a credible public private interdisciplinary bureau. Uh, this became the top five paper in the academies for the year. And we reprinted it and reran it again a year later because, frankly, we didn't think that the uh, this has been achieved to date. And we know it hasn't been achieved because we've seen what's happened with uh, misinformation and disinformation. And we know that the facts alone don't work. And when people in the scientific field say the data speak for themselves, we know as communicators that's absolutely not true. And the data do not speak. And clearly, the facts were not working alone. So we needed to build more trust and work in other areas. And that's some of what we'll talk about, what we've been doing and some recommendations. And just to remind, there's been communication fumbles. Uh, again, with Larry Gostin, we wrote a piece to be top on, uh, on the, what the CDC is doing well on the science, but how they were communicating. And um, unfortunately, you know, we, we were not the only ones speaking about this. The science was not enough. And the social science of communication. At CUNY, we have a health communication for social change program, a graduate program that focuses very specifically on the communication on great public health foundational and scientific base. And I, just a couple of other points. The, the federal government wasn't doing great. The states weren't doing great either. The New York Times wrote a piece on the unmitigated chaos of color-coded guidance. It was turquoise as good in New Mexico, purple in Colorado, red, yellow, green in other states. And even New York City's had trouble with reinstituting this uh, in early this year. And then, of course, we're on monkeypox. Uh, I, I hold this on my on my desk still. The, the Wall Street Journal on June the 8th, just saying, dropping the guidance on masks. Uh, you may recall there was some miscommunicate. Well, I call it miscommunication but some mistakes that were made. And in the last two hours, uh, the CDC director, as reported in the Washington Post, talked about a major shakeup um, citing COVID mistakes. And um, one of the recommendations is the communication office. So we've been working uh, on the Institute of Medicine definition. Um, health is what we do together as a society to ensure all the conditions which everyone can be healthy. And we work very much amongst community efforts and others. And I'll show that in the next couple of slides and then turn it over to Wafa. Uh, one area we also put forward was the idea of using communication uh, in a positive way that works with both the government being the health system decision maker uh, on perhaps the middle and the left, but also getting the public citizens more engaged because we think at the end of the day, we wanted obviously the public to be engaged from making their own health decisions and also communicating. The challenge that's happened with the misinformation and the infodemic as termed by the World Health Organization and later the US Surgeon General's report on confronting uh, health misinformation, we have a big issue here. And the unfortunate nature that I'm very worried about is we've driven a wedge that's already affecting routine vaccination, trust in public health officials, government officials, and we're seeing this in all, all acts. Uh, and we need to really figure out a way to build trust in government and health officials. Later in the appendix, which I won't go over today, but we'll have uh, for Alliance members and others, we have this whole checklist of how to do this and how to work amongst this multi-sectoral approach. And this is what the checklist basically says, uh, how health professionals can use ethical and reliable and communication strategies on infectious disease, how the checklist helps be a compass that we, we have the checks and balances. Do our messages resonating? Are we doing the appropriate formative research? Are we dynamic in nature as the evidence and data changes? Are we able to speak both with passion and reason? All of these things are super important in how we need to be effective now with monkeypox, but even more importantly, I'm building long-term trust. 
We know what the communication effectiveness is based on, goes back in the, in the field, again, motions, avoiding chaos. How do we make things simple? How do we avoid acronyms and the non-technical nature that we're trained? And then finally, how can this check this align federal, state, territorial, local, as well as having the media having uh, the, the right messages to give. And we already have those challenges that we've seen with monkeypox, including people saying things like, it's a twin pandemic with COVID. So there's lots of challenges of how we're going wrong. Uh, and I, this checklist is meant to help people to do better. And as you can see on the, on the sources, um, this was the first time I did the maxims before checklist for the WHO on transmissible spongiform encephalopathies on mad cow disease, and later we updated for Ebola, and then we later updated it for COVID. And then finally, I want to highlight work that we've been doing at CUNY with this New York vaccine literacy campaign. Lauren Rao, who's the contact, is also on the alliance and, and on the call here. And we've developed a year more on vaccine literacy in general, but the main focus was COVID. Now we're working on catching up on vaccinations, on, on routine and child. We obviously have an issue with polio that maybe that'll be part of the discussion here today. And we have a lot of different communication channels that were used. And in the interest of um, the topic today, we've actually put something on the vaccine literacy campaign on monkeypox, of course, as we, we just heard earlier from CDC that vaccinations are recommended, but what does it mean? Uh, how do we... Uh, get people to the right resources when they're testing do they know that they also can have a vaccine or schedule it and um, you can sign up for text alerts with the, um, the monkeypox piece with the city so all in all that's my sort of rushed uh piece for what we've been doing and i want to remind uh where we are both globally and nationally and it it reflects in dr lewinsky's note of the uh, of the cdc work reorganizing but also what what helen clark uh said on the independent panel for pandemic preparedness and response over a year ago uh, that our current institutions, public and private, fail to protect from a devastating pandemic. Without change, these institutions will not prevent a future one. Um, you know, it's with this in mind, we're working and, and Waffle will talk about our Pandemic Response Institute in New York. We're working on community efforts, communication efforts, uh, public-private partnerships, multi-sectoral engagement, and unique ways for, for health communication, for social change, but also health communication with our overarching theme to build trust in public health, thereby you know, rising tides for everyone um, from health equity to um, uh, ethical approaches. So that's it. Uh, I, I know um, my, my contact info might be there, but um, I think I'm gonna end the share screen and turn it over to Wafa to mm -hmm. um, give the second half here. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you very much, Scott. Uh, very much appreciated. And thank you for the invitation. Uh, I have a a couple of um, a few slides that I'm going to share with you. Um, so what I thought I would do is um, is talk to you about monkeypox and the lessons of history, and um, coming uh, from uh, somebody myself whose career really has been um, uh, very much uh, influenced and guided and um, and really shaped by uh, responding to a variety of different epidemics and pandemics. Firstly, of course, with the HIV. Uh, uh, pandemic and, and now with COVID, monkeypox, and, and, and many other infectious diseases. Uh, so um, next slide, please. So when I thought about what are the key um, his, historical um, issues that we've learned from, uh, largely from HIV, but also from uh, COVID-19, uh, this is kind of lesson number one, which I uh, entitled Waiting to Act Costs Lives. And we know that that was the case certainly with the AIDS epidemic where it took many, many years before uh, it was recognized here officially in the United States. And, and certainly it took many years when, uh, uh, before uh, ad strong advocacy by people affected by HIV or living with HIV uh, transformed the response to the HIV uh, epidemic. Um, and we've known as well that on the right-hand side, you'll see, of course, um, similarly with COVID, is the delaying lockdowns uh, has been estimated to have cost uh, many thousands of lives, um, as has been, uh, as can be seen from this uh, study that was also published during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. I think the second uh, important lesson learned is in the context of any infectious disease, and I've certainly learned that uh, over many years of, of practice, is that a stigma must be combated and must be done early. Uh, and we've seen that, of course, with the HIV epidemic in particular, 
where people living with HIV, people diagnosed with AIDS were ostracized uh, in the community. And uh, it took uh, many, many years to try to overcome the stigma associated with, uh, with HIV. And uh, we've done, we've made great progress, but we, it's still there uh, even today. Similarly, of course, we've seen that there's a stigma that was associated with COVID-19 on the right lower hand corner there, you'll see the headline about the negative health effects of anti-Asian stigma in the United States during COVID-19. And now we're seeing, of course, um, the great uh, fear of uh, similarly uh, uh, stigma to be associated with monkeypox in particular uh, because of the fact that the uh, majority of individuals who have been identified with monkeypox thus far have been from the LGBT plus community, mainly men who have sex with men and transgender women. So next slide, please. The third and important lesson is that testing, treatment, and vaccines and or, or prevention must be within reach. And of course, we've seen that as well uh, with uh, throughout the HIV epidemic. We still are waiting for a vaccine, but certainly uh, testing and treatment have transformed and prevention, other prevention methods have transformed the outlook uh, for HIV. Uh, but at the same time, we, we have seen the missteps in the response to COVID-19 with um, the delay in availability of testing, uh, the, uh, the initial missteps in terms of expansion of vaccine access, and then the, the fear, the disparity that's been noted in terms of access to antivirals to treat uh, COVID-19. And now, again, the fear is that we're seeing similarly, um, again, that the, um, the issues around access to testing for uh, monkeypox, as well as, of course, access to treatment and access to vaccines, where already we're noting uh, disparities, racial and ethnic disparities already uh, documented in access to the monkeypox vaccine. Next slide. And then, of course, importantly, is we've learned also the hard way that an effective response must be an equitable uh, response. Um, and uh, we've seen that, of course, uh, throughout the, uh, the HIV epidemic, as well as also through uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and now we are seeing again uh, with the um, response to monkeypox is that we, in order to stem this outbreak, uh, we, everybody is keenly aware is that we have to take an, 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 a response. We have to create a response that, that, takes, that takes into account the importance of equity in everything we do, every step in responding to this, uh, this, this new outbreak. Next slide. And then, of course, uh, this is lastly, is that global health must be prioritized. Uh, the, I always say that viruses do not respect uh, borders, uh, so that the last principle to always keep in mind that we've learned from HIV, from COVID, and now from monkeypox, is that in order to really have an effective response, uh, it has to be equitable, but also we have to take into account that we are one global community, uh, and we've seen that and the importance of this in the HIV response, certainly in the COVID response, as well as now we're seeing, again, the disparity in access to testing, treatment, and vaccines for monkeypox in some of the uh, low-resource uh, countries uh, where, um, where monkeypox has been endemic uh, for decades uh, and decades. Next slide. So that was it in terms of the lessons that I thought I would highlight to you. I wanted to just quickly tell you a bit about the New York City Pandemic Response Institute. And as was mentioned, uh, this is uh, funded by New York City uh, and uh, led by ICAP at Columbia University with key partnership with the CUNY School of Public Health. Next slide, please. So what are we trying to do? We're working uh, to try to have a conceptualized, kind of working across the whole of society. So um, in, we are aiming to have essentially a multi-sectoral advisory council, as well as a governing board with city agencies and many, many different diverse partners. And we structured it um, around, uh, as you see on this figure, uh, around uh, four technical cores and three cross-cutting teams. And uh, first of all, uh, the technical cores include innovation and scaling. The second technical core is focused on data collection, sharing, and translation. The third technical core is focused on workforce capacity and preparedness. And the, the fourth one is epidemiology and modeling. And then we have three cross-cutting in the arrows at the bottom three cross-cutting uh, teams. One is focused on community convening and learning. The second is on communications, health communications. That's the one that Scott co-leads. 
And then last, lastly, the racial equity and social determinants of health. And the idea is that to take all the lessons we've learned from COVID-19 and try to, through the, this structure here, and with the guidance from an advisory council and many, many other uh, stakeholders around the city to be able to prepare, to be prepared uh, for anything, any health emergency in the future, not just pandemics, but could be climate emergencies, heat emergencies, and other emergencies. Next slide. And we very much want this to be an all of city approach. So the idea is to have, um, you know, um, uh, fo focus areas of hubs, community hubs situated in all the, the different boroughs of New York City. So we're able to work with these communities uh, uh, to in engage with them in terms of the activities of PRI, but at the same time also to have these community groups, um, uh, to have these community, these communities be able to inform all the work of of a PRI from day one. Next slide, please. We've done a few things just to focus on monkeypox. We've also been trying to, uh, again, trying to um, disseminate information. So we have had two recent webinars. One was uh, the one on the left is from New York City to Nigeria, monkeypox outbreak. And we had uh, guest speakers from, uh, from Nigeria, from the Nigeria CDC, as well as from here from CDC, our CDC. And, New York City and uh, from advocates as well. And then we also had a second uh, webinar on the right-hand side, which is really focused on communications and how can communications can prevent misinformation and stigma. And this uh, webinar on the right was uh, organized by, uh, by Scott and Bruce Lee um, uh, together as part of the uh, PRI effort. Next slide. We also have developed some communication platforms and I encourage you to visit the website, pri.nyc, uh, to see some of the materials and, and uh, information that we're trying to highlight and social media, as well as also providing email updates regarding uh, a variety of different key um, infectious diseases. Next slide. And lastly, if you want, we have a daily update. Um, it's called Daily News and Scientific Update. And this focuses on all infectious disease of interest, key infectious disease of interest. We're focusing specifically at this point on uh, COVID-19 as well as on monkeypox. And this is available on a daily basis. And you can sign up on the website to get regular up these daily updates um, uh, that are available that summarize some of the news items, but also summarize key scientific articles as well. Next slide. And that's it from me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Angie. Great. Thanks so much. And um, th three really great presentations and I think really gave us an explanation of the science and kind of where we are with the disease, as well as how we might want to communicate about it. And specifically how in New York City, they've done a really nice job, I think, of taking a whole society approach. Um, if you all have questions, feel free to raise your hands <coughs> add them to the chat. Um, but I will start with a question, um, perhaps starting with CDC and then going to the others. Are there specific recommendations that you have for those of us who come from another different sectors and partners um, as to steps we might need to take um, for our own organizations when we're thinking about how to reply to or respond to monkeypox? So this is really about sort of health communication messaging. Yeah, so I think, I think we've been trying to put as much information up on the CDC website as, as uh, humanly possible that is digestible, uh, both on the status of this current outbreak um, and then making sure we've got good harm reduction messaging out there, safer sex social gatherings and monkeypox messaging for the LGBTQ plus community, um, reducing stigma and monkeypox communication and community engagement uh, uh, work. And I think it's been really lovely to see um, what Dr. El Sadar and Dr. Ratson have also um, outlined in terms of their use. I think we want to make sure we don't stigmatize the population that's currently disproportionately affected. We also want people to be prepared that we could see disease introduction into under individuals and to make sure that then messages are accessible to multiple members of our population without stigmatizing anyone subgroup. Is 
Scott or Rafa, anything else you'd like to add? I think um, one thing we also are worried about, and I think we keep seeing in the news, and I think Scott's slide about fear really points it out, is that there is that kind of line between how do we make sure that we're educating people without you know, kind of causing additional fear or letting people feel there's not a rational response. And so um, just I think some of your approach of bringing in partners, um, Wafa and Scott, is a really great one. And didn't know if you had recommendations on how that's happened, so people feel educated and empowered rather than kind of afraid to act. I mean, I'll just mention, I think, not only the partners, but some of the terms that we use, um, pre-exposure prophylaxis, I mean, we were talking about that term, I remember early of HIV, with the global fund level before we had, we had the meds that we would be even to have as long acting injectables. And what would we call it? We shortened it to PrEP and that began at least in the lexicon. Now we have this potential post-exposure prophylaxis. I don't think it's even very clear, at least it hasn't been top of the messaging that you can get this within four days, uh, that it is effective as well as the 28 day uh, difference that Dr. Damone talked about, but also that, you know, the fact that we are, we, we, there are enough doses here. So I just think there's some more simplicity of how we talk about it and what the key pieces are. So TMI that we know that too much information by putting it all on the website is not, is not good communication. Uh, we need to have, have it focused in such a way. And we've tried to, even the, the piece that we did with New York city that I mentioned that Lauren Rao did with vaccine literacy campaign, it's four pages. And, you know, and that's even long. So it doesn't mean you shrink the font and put it all together on one. So, you know, I think there's ways that we need to think about how, how we're, we're talking about it and um, also think of, of opportunities. So every time somebody is going in for a test, that that is the opportunity to do the education and link up for vaccination, whether it's ready that day or to book an appointment or, or to have the education part. Uh, for it. So those are the kind of pieces that we can't miss. Uh, and I think that what we learned from COVID is a lot of those were missed. Uh, and, and we have a lot of data. I mean, all of you on the call and others are doing surveys and so forth that show where people get vaccination, why they get vaccinated, why they will or won't wear a mask. All those issues are, are in play as well. So I, lots to do. So, I mean, I agree with Scott. And I do think that the more specific we are, the better. I find that in many webinars and talking to colleagues and so on, is people have a very specific fear in their mind. Like uh, people say, if I brush against somebody in the subway and my arm touches their arm, am I gonna get monkeypox? You know, don't worry about that. You know, <laughs> is that, uh, that people have these incredible fears. If I go swimming in the swimming pool if, and the, the more we can give examples of things that, you know, there are some things to worry about and some things you don't have to worry about. And we have to be obviously always humble and say at this point in time, I always preface everything about transmission and risk by saying at this point in time, this is what we know. Because another mistake we've made often in the past in public health is uh, we spoke with certainty and then knowledge changed, new information, new evidence comes around and then we have to go, to, you know, go backwards. Um, so I think the more we can always anchor our, our communications at this moment in time, this is what we know. You, you need to worry about this. You need to be cautious about this. At this point in time, you don't really need to worry about this and unless something we have new information that proves otherwise. Great, thank you. I do wanna turn it to the group if we can um, and just wanted to hear also from all of you, if there are things you've heard in your communities that you think we can do a better job and kind of can use this as a session to to think about approaches as to what's worked well or what you think we need to uh, focus on as gaps in our communications. And so I will let others raise their hands or type in the chat, et cetera. I don't think I'm seeing hands. So, um, I may give you all one more question while we think about it. And that is, um, are you seeing kind of a role for partners like us to help get the information out? I thought the New York City example um, of bringing in other partners long-term was really valuable. And I'm trying to think, you know, we're dealing with monkeypox right now. As Scott foreshadowed, we also um, now have polio cases that are emerging. Um, what can groups like ours do to help to amplify and kind of present these messages in ways? Is it that we talk to our own networks? Um, what are the best ways to kind of help to do that that you've seen? And are there examples of both what to do and also 
what hasn't worked well that we might want to consider. I think I, I'm a, maybe I can add one thing, if you don't mind, Angie, is I, I'm also um, having been really um, very much formed in many ways professionally and personally by the HIV epidemic. I'm a great believer in the principle of nothing about us without us is that it's really important to, um, um, as we talk about monkeypox, as we have conversations about this, it's really important to have voices of the most affected community. Um, they bring a perspective that's important um, and they will often highlight issues that frankly, I haven't, I haven't thought about. And uh, so I feel like in as much as possible to engage um, affected communities or most vulnerable or most affected communities in our communications, in our discussions, uh, because I think it, it brings a, a critical value um, to these discussions and can also help us uh, shape uh, better and more effective communication messages overall. I, and um, I, I agree with what Wafa said and how strong and important that is. And um, we all know, or we may have read that the WHO is calling for a new name of monkeypox. Uh, there's been discussion in the US also, um, how can this group or others try to contribute to that? But it's not, again, I think it's what Waf is saying, ask the actual people who are affected, You know, is it the same stigma that's being mentioned in Geneva that might be the same stigma in New York or other parts of the US? Uh, I think that's that's one thing just to think about what's in a name. And, uh, you know, I pulled out, I first, uh, in the 1980s, I was in med school and had the first AIDS-related uh, dementia that, that uh, presented when I was at LA County Hospital. And um, remember riding up in the fear of the attendings who wouldn't even go in the room. And the fear of those days, it was it was Haitian, uh, don't even know, remember anymore about orientation, but we called it a, you know, it was a Haitian and an AIDS related complex. And then it was HTLV3 and then HIV, the virus that caused AIDS. There still is an opportunity to name it properly. And uh, I don't know if, if this group, if that answers your question, Angie, and I see Georges has some probably ideas already to, on this one. No, I don't have any other ideas. I think, you, I think you're right on target. There's time to, to get this right. Um, but, but we've got to get it right because it's, going through several different name changes, it won't stick. Yep. Right, and so I'll just add and you sort of echo, echo the prior speaker's comments. I think it's it's completely important to engage the community that's currently so disproportionately affected to understand what their concerns are um, and how to address them and uh, give them appropriate messages to allow them to protect themselves, allow them to think through the nuances of vaccine um, and therapeutics, and then you know, use that information to refine messages to make sure the messages are appropriate. And so I think certainly using the alliance members in terms of uh, the communities that they reach with and uh, in terms of understanding, you know, if, if communities are not affected, what are the fears that they have and what's the information that will help them to feel like they have the information they need to make informed decisions. Um, I think those are the kind of things that are going to calm down. I think the the tenor of where we are, which is, is, is so critical, I think, to be able to make progress on it. Um, you know, in terms of name changing, so full disclosure, I'm part of the ICTV, which is the virology group, which names the virus. And we've already had a number of spirited discussions about change in name of the virus and the consideration there because the historic precedent and other viruses that it was first identified in non-human primates and monkeys and that's why it's got its name back in 1958. Um, you know, do you change the name of the disease? Who gets to do that? Is the World Health Organization? Do others get to? So I think, you know, that does need to be a more of a global conversation. And then again, understanding what are the concerns, um, you know, with, with the name of the disease that what, what does it conjure up for folks? So. I think the other maybe lesson learned is I, I um, is that uh, you know this gets back to uh, what we're trying to do at PRI, which is to be the preparedness piece. I mean, <laughs> we've known about this virus for decades and decades, and it's it's caused outbreaks in parts of, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. in parts of Central and West Africa, but yet we kind of never really prepared for it. <laughs> you know, we were worried, more worried about a smallpox bioterrorism 
uh, event, and that's what motivated the, right. the discovery of uh, treatment that we're using now, right. as well as the vaccines right. that we're using now were right. developed right. largely right. in the event of a uh, of a, a smallpox right. body terrorism right. event. But we did not think about this potential virus as as going outside the borders of DRC or Nigeria or Ghana. Yeah, and and, and I think that's the lesson learned. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's an important lesson learned uh, mm -hmm. is that um, right. is that we have to break those borders. Like I was mentioning, one mm -hmm. of the principles we have to think globally and and really think uh, as as one global community. We're vulnerable, and how can we think ahead so we're not always kind of doing catch up and trying right. to respond um, in a, a, you know the respond yeah. in, a, in an emergency. Yeah. And I guess I, I'll, I'll challenge that a little bit. And I agree that I think it's been really fascinating. For me, it's been a real education in equity and expectations of communities in terms of what will be available to them. So back when we were initially working on the modified vaccinia Ankara vaccine, which is now known as Genios in the United States, Invanex elsewhere, Invimmune elsewhere, you know, Barney and Graham and I went to DRC to talk about, you know, this would be a great opportunity to set up a clinical trial and look at efficacy and in a real world monkeypox in DRC. And there was considerable reticence that, you know, this was experimenting on, you know, a, a, a population and there wasn't equity there. Um, so we have initiated before just as vaccine was being licensed in the US or just before, we did work with the human subjects group in DRC to initiate a vaccination program for healthcare workers in the province of DRC, where we've been doing surveillance for many years in Onishwapa province. We had great uptake. Healthcare workers were highly engaged. There was lots of good education. Healthcare workers had been disproportionately affected by the disease as well in the region where we've been doing work. And so there was interest in getting vaccinated. And once they understood the risks and benefits, um, they um, enrolled, everybody followed up, got their second dose. Um, and again, we didn't have a control arm. Um, we're hoping that we'll be, but the safety data looks good um, and we're hoping that by looking at historic controls, we may get some idea of efficacy as well as potentially duration. So it really it is that idea of, you know, once the product has, you know, a stamp of approval, there is greater uptake. And so looking for regulatory approval. And so it's, it's for me, it's been, it's an interesting education. And I, I came from clinically, you know, an HIV, you know, very intensive infectious disease experience when I was at NIAID um, and then also continuing to do clinical work. And so it really has been an, an interesting issue to think about how we work equitably internationally um, and, and engage scientists uh, to help us with these problems. So. so George, let me ask one question. Um, I know it's getting close to our our end time. Um, the whole issue of testing. Um, you know, can can someone walk through the this the actual mechanics of, of of getting the test? How long it takes to get back? Why it takes so long to get test back? Is it a um, a growth um, you know um, test? Is it a PCR test? I don't know that the group knows. Yeah. Go ahead, Ingrid. So I can I can start, and then th those who do clinical medicine now can probably give you the real answer. <laughs> but so really, we we've been working on diagnostic capacity for orthopox viruses for many years, and so had supported within the laboratory response network in terms of the highest tier of the labs, so the reference labs, the capacity to do um, orthopox virus testing, which would include monkeypox, and we actually used those labs in 2003 in the U.S. monkeypox outbreak as well as smallpox specific testing in a smaller subset of labs. You know, when the, you know, when we first saw the first case in the US, we had probably labs on board that had done their CLIA proficiency testing or about able to do probably about six, five to 6,000 tests a week. Um, and it became clear to us that 
uh, clinicians really didn't know how to access the state public health lab system to use that capacity. And so there was an effort to look at the, the assay that we had developed, which was FDA approved within the laboratory response network and roll it out to commercial labs. So right now, the delay, I think, is related, I think, to the time between picking up the specimen, getting the specimen to the lab, and then reporting back the result. And I'm not sure if there's also, uh, I think the result, and so this is what I don't know, what, where the result, I think the re result goes immediately back to the provider, but it may also go back to, the pub, I'm getting nodding, excellent. So back to the public health department, so after the provider. So, you know, why the delay? I think I think the delay in the beginning was because there was a challenge in figuring out how to get the specimen to the public health lab. The idea of bringing commercial labs on board was that there was greater familiarity and ease with like doing the test request and getting the picked up. So I can't explain, um, you know, why we're continuing to see delays. Is it is it a PCR test? Yes, I'm sorry, it's a PCR test. <laughs> Yeah, I, actually, I think the one thing that has improved substantially is the turnaround time for the test with the availability of testing at the commercial labs, as, uh, as you mentioned, Inger. Um, I think the uh, now it comes within a day or two, actually, so that's improved substantially. I think the major issue is we need to continue to disseminate information to people when they develop uh, symptoms or lesions that or rash or sores, that they do go and seek diagnosis, that's really important. And also for providers, uh, because sometimes these sores can look like syphilis, they can look like herpes, for example. So I think it's both an educational effort towards the, the population itself in terms of seeking care, seeking diagnosis, but also to providers not to dismiss this as something else, but to do send uh, specimens for a diagnosis of, of this virus, because obviously it needs to um, to, to have, there's a different test that needs to be done, there are different PCR tests. Angie, back to you to close out. You mute it. Sorry, yes, now I'm forgetting to unmute myself. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, I know we had three really amazing presentations. If possible, we will share your slides or information later. Um, and for everyone, if the resources that you have found helpful about this, um, I know CDC and um, Scott and Wafa's resources have a lot of great things, but um, we'll be happy to share those with the group too. And so I um, really appreciate taking this time to help us think about the issue, how we might be able to help to address it and to really make sure that we're all thinking about the implications on equity and how we can communicate. So um, thanks to everybody. Have a great rest of summer. Talk to you in September. Thanks. Thank thanks. you. Thank you. Bye-bye.